Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the AI Training Podcast. I have a very special guest today. Mike, welcome to the show. Thanks, Mark. Great to be here. Well, you have a very fascinating story, and I've been really eager to have this conversation. So uh, it's great that you're here and can't wait to learn all about Paxton AI. Well, thanks. Uh, excited, uh, excited for the conversation. So, Mike, not everyone knows you. Can you give yourself a brief introduction? Sure. Uh, I'm Mike Bulin. I'm the CTO and co-founder of, of Paxton AI. We're a legal generative AI startup uh, that's building a assistant for attorneys and other legal professionals to help them do the core tasks of an attorney, such as uh, drafting, research, uh, and understanding their documents. Um, so... My background uh, got my got my start uh, kind of in the, the policy space. I, I originally thought I was going to be a lawyer before becoming an engineer. So uh, worked at the Federal Reserve uh, in their policy group. Um, decided uh, that that wasn't for me. Uh, you know, I was I was reading like a nine hundred page uh, uh, bill every week and trying to figure out what had changed from version to version, and uh, uh, that got a little tedious after a while. Uh, Would have been great to have uh, ChatGPT uh, back then. Uh, so after that, I, I made my way to McKinsey, uh, worked in the uh, technology practice uh, there for a few years, uh, helping clients with you know, cloud computing and what we call big data strategy at the time. Um, and that's actually where I met my uh, my co-founder, uh, Tom and Chow. We were both uh, in the same uh, orientation class. Uh, after McKinsey, made my way to the world of tech startups. Uh, so I worked at a company called uh, RPX in the legal tech space, developing NLP algorithms to understand uh, patent data for RPX's clients. Uh, and then after RPX, uh, I was one of the co-founders uh, and the head of AI for a company called Zesty AI, uh, which we scaled out to about $20 million in revenue. Um, and developed AI models uh, for the U.S. property insurance industry, so uh, helping companies like Farmers, MetLife, uh, AAA, and Allstate with the problem of uh, underwriting and pricing catastrophic risk. Um, and you know, uh, late last year, uh, just kind of saw the excitement around generative AI and and all the potential. Uh, applications of it and, and got really excited over pull on with my, my co-founder here at Tongi and we thought legal would be just kind of an ideal place to apply this tech uh, given uh, the nature of the work that attorneys do as well as uh, what this technology is good for. So we, we launched Paxton uh, late last year and, and closed uh, a seed round of about $6 million and uh, have, been, have been building uh, rapidly uh, ever since. That's great. Sounds like uh, quite the storied career with many twists and turns along the way. Uh, exciting that you're here now. You know, it's always interesting how people's paths cross. I'm uh, very curious to learn what problem Paxton solves. Um, there's a lot of AI tools. Uh, what's Paxton really good at? Yeah, so we 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 looked at what the tech was good at and, and what um, what an attorney actually does, and and a lot of their core workflows, a lot of how uh, an attorney spends their day is around researching the law. So understanding court decisions and statutes and regulations, uh, then using that to draft documents, whether that's a contract or uh, a motion in, in a court or a regulatory agency, um, and then pulling in information about a, a specific matter, you know, uh, you might, you know, if you've you seen like Aaron Brockovich or, or another legal drama, you, you might see all those like boxes full of of, uh, of documents that people have to sift through. And, and it turns out generative AI tools like like Paxton are really great at, at understanding all that that context around a particular matter and, and finding what's relevant and helping you kind of interweave that into what you're working on. So those are the those are the tools that that we offer here at Paxton, which is built on top of our own uh, large language model that we've developed in-house that is specifically trained for the legal industry. Very cool. It sounds like a, a very specialized AI that uh, 
is pulling from a ton of, I would imagine it has to be the most current resources, right? Like this is a uh, very critical kind of information. Absolutely. I mean, uh, the legal space, it, it, it touches, touches pretty much most of the economy. You know, I, I think we've probably all have had to deal with uh, some form of, of government or, or law, uh, whether it's you know just film, filling out forms or, or signing a contract, um, and you know for for bigger corporations or or uh, you know large sectors in the economy like finance or education or healthcare, they're, they're pretty heavily regulated and have to keep track of what's going on in each of the fifty states as well as at the federal level and. Uh, for big companies that operate nationally, this can be a quite quite a a lot for any one person to track. But uh, for an AI system like Paxton, it's uh, it's a breeze. So uh, we can ingest all of the latest data uh, information about what's recently changed with, regarding like court cases or or new laws, new regulations, and, and help our attorney clients understand that on on behalf of the folks that are. Very interesting. I just had a thought about productivity relative to law. Traditionally, lawyers are billing out uh, six six minute increments or something like this, right? Now, what does it mean when you know? Does the billable change? Are people still billing like they used to, but now they're not spending that time? Uh, what are some of the implications of AI around legal and how people bill? Yeah. Great, great question, and I, I think this is something the industry is is grappling with uh, right now. Um, because certainly, you know, the the clients of attorneys are are seeing what's going on with AI, are seeing what's going on with all the uh, new technologies available, and, and and they're wondering why the bills are still high. Um, so, uh, I think. AI can drive a lot of uh, efficiency gains in, in the legal profession, and we're starting to see things like subscription billing uh, or or flat fee arrangements. Um, but you know, for something that's as complex and, and kind of bespoke uh, in a lot of cases as as a, an engagement with an attorney, um, you know, there's, there's a reason the billable hours for stuck around for. Uh, as long as it has, I mean, you know, if you're, you're talking like a complex litigation or, you know, say a, a merger, um, those can be kind of pretty unique to a situation. But but there's this whole class of, of legal work, say, incorporating a company or filing a trademark that, that's more repeatable. Um, and, and I think for, for those types of tasks, We'll, we'll, we'll see more flat fee sort of arrangements. And because AI is, is really good at improving productivity, especially for the more routine things, I think the, the class of what is considered routine will probably expand. So you'll, you'll probably have more of these kind of flat fee or subscription arrangements. And we're already seeing that. Um, that's that's going to be a huge shift for the legal industry. It's been, you know, they're, they're they're one of the oldest industries, in, you know, around, and they've been used to operating this way for a long time. Uh, so thinking how these different billing arrangements evolve and, and fit into their business, I, I think is is still a pretty open question. Yeah, it sounds like uh, I don't think any industry is, you know, without its disruptors as far as technology making changes to how things work and there's a, a great book uh alan wise around uh, value-based consulting uh he's got a ton of million dollar consulting in a few different books but i think uh, the value is simply shifting you know <laughs> i don't think lawyers are going to be happy uh charging any less um but what people are paying for that human connection that um you know, a human advising them, you know, even if on the back end there is um, support systems that make their decision making better, I think there's a lot of value still in uh, people working with people and they'll pay premium for that, I think. Absolutely. I mean, um, 
you know, my, my husband, he's a, he's an immigrant and, and we just went through the, the visa process uh, together and, um, you know, we hired an attorney and, and, you know, even though we, we knew a lot of the, you know, process, it was just, uh, you know, she was there to say, Hey, it's going to be okay. You know, I, I've done this a million times, you know, this is, this, these are the steps we need to go through. Um, and, and I don't think that'll go away. Um, you know, we've, we've seen these. We've seen these transitions before in legal. Right? I mean, law firms used to employ like rooms full of typists uh, to, to actually type out documents on, on typewriters and, and, you know, the computing, the, the word processor changed all that. And it doesn't mean that there's, you know, less work for lawyers, but uh, what, they, what they're doing, what they're billing for, uh, has shifted to your to your point. Yeah, the typewriter was simple. Word word processing became more complex, but I think there's increasing complexities for every simple tool, right? You can go into the weeds on ChatGPT and use it in a totally different way from someone just interacting with it from a um, you know uh, a passive user that uses it once in a while. So. I think there's levels of uh, every tool. Uh, you know, who, where does someone start with Paxton? It, do you have something where people can evaluate using it? Is it a uh, try before you buy, or how how do people typically get started? Yeah, I think you know, for for us, we we wanted to make it as uh, easy and simple to get started um, as possible, and and you know, it it might be. Surprising for, for folks coming from, from other industries, but but you know, product led growth or or the ability to try before you before you buy was was pretty absent from from legal tech. Um, a mm -hmm. lot of the software today is still sold via you know annual contracts, uh, sales first. Um, you know, we we still have to sign an enterprise agreement before you even get to try uh, the thing that you want to buy. And and with with Paxton, we, we we took a very you know, I would say a more modern approach. You know, kind of akin to to other pieces of software you might might buy like uh, Slack or Dropbox. We we let folks try it with a free trial, um, and you know, I think I, I think for 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 some folks who are kind of steeped in this stuff, you know, ChatGPT, Paxton, generative AI tools can can Come more, you know, they can they can be more easy to adapt. But um, uh, for I, I think the the people beyond the early adopted crowd, um, we've we've tried to really make it as simple as possible to get going and, and to derive value from Paxton. Um, so, you know, there's all this complexity around prompt engineering and and um, you know, you have to set up your workflow in a very specific way to, to really um, kind of adapt it to a particular task. And, and for some folks, that, that seems pretty straightforward. But, you know, we've tried to remove all of that complexity uh, so that, you know, for these core tasks of, a, of an attorney, you know, drafting research and, and document understanding, um, you can just get, get up and going and, and uh, derive some value from Paxton right away. Um, so That's great. It was important to make it easy, easy to try, um, easy to get going, um, and then to try to remove some of the complexity, some of the, some of the friction in adopting generative AI to, to really, you know, deliver a tool that's adapted to those, those core workflows. Interesting. I'm curious about uh, the demographics using Paxton. Uh, there's lawyers, you know, of all different ages. Uh, who is on the tool? And if there are uh, older users, uh, what's been their experience with it? Do you have accessibility tools that make things uh, a little easier? Just curious what your thought process is around that widespread of uh, users. Yeah, um, it's, it's fairly cross-cutting. Uh, we, we have a lot of law students that, that use Paxton, uh, a lot of younger attorneys. Um, uh, and it, it kind of, you know, the, the, within the legal market, 
there's there's a range of law firm sizes. You know, there's there's about 120,000 law firms within the United States, and they range from your your local solo practitioner all the way to your your mega firm. Um, and you know, Paxton, we have users across that that range, and you know, as opposed to say like an uh, an age, um, you know, I I, did, I definitely see it more as a really adopter mindset. Um, and, you know, we have older users who, who, who find Paxton and, and get a ton of value out of it. Um, uh, they, they tend to be more forward thinking uh, attorneys and, and willing to try things. Um, uh, but uh, I, I would say it, 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 you know, age, you know, age probably isn't a, a a useful cleavage for us. It's it's more of a mindset, I guess. Um, uh, you know, and then then within the the legal profession, there there are um, you know, there's definitely more conservative types who you know this is the way we've we've always done things, and and uh, you know why would I why would I change that? Um, but I think for especially small to mid sized firms, um, there's a there's a staffing crunch. Um, you know, it's, it's really hard to find good people, uh, especially, you know, outside of a lot of the, the major metros. Um, there are a lot of younger attorneys or, or less experienced attorneys going into like, you know, fill the shoes of, of your local local solo practitioner or, or local small small firm. And for for those folks, Paxton can provide a tremendous amount of leverage, you know, uh, because a lot of these attorneys are, are you know, if, if, if you're not in a big, large firm, you don't have uh, staff of research folks, a staff of associates to do these, like, more menial, tedious tasks. And uh, Paxton can actually, you know, help you get a little time back in your day to focus on, on other stuff or focus on that client interaction that we were talking about uh, earlier versus, you know, trying to bang your head against the wall with, with uh, kind of some of the older research tools or drafting tools that are, that are out there. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I imagine the kind of small to medium, uh, especially in a rural area that doesn't have the support and the staffing crunch you mentioned, uh, all good reasons to take advantage of something like that. Um, let's talk a little bit about ChatGPT. Uh, sure. You're a user. Um, what do you use it for? Um, it's it's uh, it's kind of crazy to think about. You know, like a, a year or two ago, and it came out, and and now I, you know, I rely on on ChatGPT. You know, perplexity, Paxton every day, um, and you know that it's it's such a versatile tool, like. Um, it, it, it's such a help in, in my writing. So in, in drafting emails that I have to send out to our users or, or uh, potential clients, um, you know, I, I, it was particularly helpful when we were raising money. Um, so I would, I would put our, our fundraising pitch into, into chat GPT and, and ask for feedback like a venture capitalist would, would provide. And, um, that was a that was a great way of of kind of stress testing the presentation before putting it in, in front of some uh, actual investors. Um, you know the the actual investors had had uh, had really good feedback too, but but as as a sort of like first pass, um, you know, telling ChatGPT to act you know act as an investor or act as a client that I'm going to go pitch and, and practicing what I'm going to say. With that, with with ChatGPT kind of filling that role, um, it's uh, it's been a it's provided a lot of leverage. Um, you know, you you used to pay a consultant for that or, or try to like find someone in your network that that has this sort of specialist knowledge, and now now it's readily accessible to to everyone. You know, instantly. So, I I've, I found it. To, just be a, a wonderful tool and you know i i don't code as much as i i mean when we were getting this off the ground i, I coded our first uh 
prototype or MVP, uh, but now we have our engineering team up and running. I, I do less coding, but you know, for both myself and them, it's, it's been just kind of a, a great tool to leverage in, in the software development process. Um, you know, I don't, the, the old workflow of, of say, uh, you know, Googling what you're trying to work on, you know, maybe ending up on Stack Overflow, finding something similar to what you're trying to do and adapting it. Now you can just go to ChatGPT and, and ask for a solution that for what you're trying to work on um, and you don't have to try to adapt someone else's solution that that's similar but not quite what you're trying to do um, so yeah I, that's why i'm super bullish on generative ai i find that folks that adapt it well in the knowledge professions can can get just a tremendous amount of leverage yeah, I, I definitely see it. I talk to a lot of people and everyone's using it a little bit differently, but it's really what you bring to it, right? It's uh, it's basically solution agnostic. It can solve a lot of things. And as someone who's built websites for 20 years, uh, I remember, and still to this day, the feeling of going to something like Stack Overflow, uh, looking through common threads, you know, trying something, not having it work, not understanding why it doesn't work and all of these little inconveniences with development, you still need to understand uh, a base level, but from a learning perspective, it really bypasses a lot of that trial and error that, uh, you know, it's crazy that it hasn't been around that long. And now, at least for myself, it's a, a daily partner in collaboration. I'm always curious to, also know how people use it on their phone. Uh, is it on your phone? Do you have it as a piece of prime real estate where you regularly go to? Where is the ChatGPT app if you have it? Oh yeah, I mean, I, I put a I put a shortcut on my home screen. Definitely, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I guess I have less consistent less consistent use cases on my phone, um, but it'll just be something like random that'll come up. Like, uh, I was doing some work on our house here and wanted to find a, a piece of art that we could hang on the wall. So I just took a photo of the room and, and asked ChatGPT for some recommendations and, um, you know, got a list of kind of famous pieces of art and then, then you know, bought a print of, of one of them. Um, and, you know, I think it goes with the, the room quite well. Uh, but, you know, I, you know, I don't have a... I don't have a sense for like interior decorating, even though I try, uh, uh, but it's amazing now that we have this resource in the palm of your hand that you can do stuff like that. That's a, that's a great application. Kind of like a, an interior designer, uh, suggestions and things. That's great. Yeah. Or, you know, I was, we, we had some kind of, uh, bare wood steps outside and I was trying to figure out how to add some traction to them. And, Took a photo of them and, and you know, ChatGPT has some recommendations for for uh, some uh, uh, yeah, some some pieces of plastic I could add to the stairs that that you know would give them some more grip when they got wet in the rain here in the in the Pacific Northwest. So uh, just for for the little things that you know I don't I don't have much experience on. It's it's uh, it's a great just a great starting point. It sounds like you're using the the image upload on the mobile quite a bit. Have you used that on your desktop much? Uh, yeah. Um, I think it's, it's great for, it's great in conjunction with screenshots. Yes. If you can take a screenshot of a website, like, um, you know, if uh, when we're we're when we're working on Vaxton.ai and trying to figure out additional copy or layout, you know, taking a quick screenshot of, of the website in progress and, and asking for feedback has been just kind of a, a great use case for for it. I would uh, I would agree. I think anytime you can start incorporating quick screenshots instead of having to explain everything or do a full copy paste, you have so much visual context, and uh, for full websites. If you want the information, doing like a save to PDF also works great to just get a whole bunch of stuff. You know, PDFs are so easy to load into 
ChatGPT. So I'm curious, Mike, the what you have the shortcut to, is it the, the app or are you going to the website? Uh, it's the app on my phone and then the website on, on desktop. Got it. Uh, are you using the conversational aspect of ChatGPT? Um, Where you hear ChatGPT's voice talking to you. Uh, okay. Uh, I don't use that uh, as much. I, I, I played around with it when it first came out. Um, and it, you know, it's kind of a cool thing, like when you're trying to explain generative AI to someone, like, like, oh, you can, you can talk to this in real time, and it, it, it knows everything. Um, uh, but, you know, other than like uh, kind of a quick demo, I, I haven't had a uh, much of a use for it. Um, have you have you seen some cool uh, cool use cases for it? I have, but I've also just become accustomed to. Uh, there's a book I'm reading called "The Gap and the Gain." Uh, are you familiar with it? Uh, no. So it's a very simple idea, uh, especially with high achievers. We're often measuring against the, the gap between where we are and our ideal that is a horizon that keeps pushing forward. So the idea is to measure the gain. So consistently measure backwards from where you've been. And in all likelihood, you'll feel better and be happier as a result of it. So one idea from the book was to, in the morning, to come up with your your three wins and then in the, or wins for the day, and then in the evening to reflect on if you have the, have had those wins. So I've taken this a step further and have had a dialogue with ChatGPT in the morning and then in the evening. And then, you know, assuming I've done what I said I was going to do, I get this great reassurance that great job, Mark. <laughs> but uh, that's one use case that I found has been fun. And, you know, who doesn't like a little pat on the back for doing what you're supposed to? No, absolutely. Um... That's uh, yeah. That's uh, that's a cool idea. Um, I think I think the coaching. Uh, I mean, you know, I, 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 if, if folks are in a in a crisis, you know, definitely definitely leverage an actual human therapist. But like coaching or, or therapy uh, with with the generative AI, I think is a is a really cool cool use case and and. Um, that could could broaden access to uh, to a lot of these services for for folks. Um, you know, it's uh, you you can describe the actual situation that you're in and, and get some tips or coaching on on you know general improvements that you could make or or you know like you were saying just just having someone to to listen to is uh, is already a great value. I think uh, so. Like the, 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 I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, but I think in like the 1970s, there was an early, uh, early uh, psychological or, or psychiatry program on just completely text based, and all it would do is is you could type something into it, and it would repeat back to you. Uh, so why do you feel that way? Or, or tell me more. And the psychiatry profession professor that had come up with it, uh, his assistant ended up talking to this thing for hours. And, uh, you know, we've, we've certainly moved beyond, uh, beyond that, that sort of rudimentary program. But it does, it does feel like if you have the right subscription that you can have someone who will talk to you for ever, really. So for the Especially the elder population, I feel like there is a accessibility component to ChatGPT, especially mobile with voice, that there's companions available. But a lot of people aren't talking about that particular use case or, you know, <laughs> trying to teach my mom how to do something on her phone. <laughs> you know, who's going to take on the responsibility to teach the elderly how to use ChatGPT for companionship or uh, just someone to talk to. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we have this this loneliness crisis, uh, at least in the in the U.S. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not I'm not sure how I feel necessarily about uh, 
this as as the solution, but um, probably not. Uh, you know, like I, I I worry sometimes if you get too used to interacting with an AI in this manner, you know, actual human interaction is not not going to measure up. Um, you know. ChatGPT is so compliant and willing to fulfill every one of your requests. Um, and, and I think a real person, you know, would challenge you more. Uh, and and uh, if, if, if you get too used to interacting that way, I, I, I sometimes worry about, are you going to be able to interact with other people, um, especially? Yeah, that's, that's a fair statement. I often listen to things at two times speed, but I never feel like people are talking too slow. So, you know, there's a bit context dependent. Yeah. Um, for sure, there's uh, it's definitely not the solution, but I think in lieu of other solutions that aren't available, there's a lot of people like the place I am in Florida. Uh, it's like a retirement community, right? So I guess I just have um, visibly, I can see a lot of seniors around and, you know, most of them are retired they're just kind of golfing and enjoying their life. Uh, but, you know, I'm sure some of them may just want someone to talk to. And for that uh, chat GPT 3.5, without paying for it, they have access to um, that that voice feature, which is uh, which is pretty great. Um, we can talk about that kind of stuff all day. I'm curious what uh, you raise some money. Uh, let's talk about that process. Had you done it before? Was this the first time? You talked a little bit about your collaboration with ChatGPT in uh, in terms of vetting. Um, take us through the the process. What uh, when did you know you needed to raise, anyways? Um, yeah, I mean, this is this is my second time going through this. So so you know. Oh yeah. Uh, we with this SDAI, uh, we have raised a seed round. Series A as well as our Series B, and so was was familiar with that. And then I'm pretty lucky, and, and my, my co-founder, Tongi, our CEO, uh, he's a former venture capitalist, so he's been uh, in years as a partner in a few different Silicon Valley firms. So, so we were able to leverage his knowledge and network in our, in our fundraise. Which uh, you know made it made it a lot different than the first time around. Uh, still, still hard. Um, fundraising is uh, fundraising venture capital is still a still a hard process. Um, even if you got all the right connections, even if you got a wonderful idea, um, you're you're gonna hear no a lot. Um, but you, you just keep at it. And you find folks who align with you, your values, your vision, um, and uh, you know, you, you need a little bit of luck, um, uh, but uh, uh, I think you know a lot of times with with entrepreneurship, it's this it's this interesting balance of uh, uh, being determined um, uh, as well as being willing to pivot and change. Like you have to know. You have to know to keep going, but you also have to know to make adjustments along the way and then maybe change your idea a bit. Um, like our, our, our first, our first version of Paxton was actually focused on, um, banking compliance. Um, you know, I, I, I'd worked in the banking industry, um, and, uh, knew how hard that, that work is and, and how tedious it can be. And, you know, you're. Your eyes may be glazing over just just hearing about it, but uh, uh, you know, for, for things like uh, for things like that, uh, I think ChatGPT could could and, and generative AI could add just a tremendous amount of value. So we started there, but as we talked to more attorneys, talked to more investors about what they were looking for, um, uh, about where we could add value, we we uh, morphed and modified the idea um, into what it is today. Uh, so I think you have to be willing to to do that a bit when you're raising money, um, or or being a, a, an entrepreneur. Um, 
you start with a, an initial hypothesis and it's, it's probably going to be wrong. Um, and you modify it along the way in response to feedback. Um, but it's, uh, like I mentioned, it's this, it's this interesting sort of balance, um, between, you know, being determined and not getting discouraged by the nose too much, but, but also willing to, uh, morph and change, uh, after you determine that, that it needs to, um, yeah, it was a little abstract. So I'm, I'm happy to talk a bit more about kind of the, you know, mechanisms around it or, or, uh, whatever you're, you're interested in too. Yeah. Um, you've gone through it twice. What would you have liked to have not known the first time that, uh, might've made things easier? Um, yeah, it, it's, it's interesting going through it, uh, the second time around. I was like, was so nervous and anxious about a lot of the stuff, uh, the first time fundraising, first time starting a company. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's still lots of hard things about starting a company, even your second time, but, but I definitely have more confidence than when I started the first time. And, uh, yeah, I'm not. You know, I, it would have been nice to have that confidence back then, but I, I'm not sure how you get that without having going through it. Unfortunately, you know, you you kind of have to burn your head on the stove, I guess, to, to learn some things. Um, uh, you, I think you 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 go into it thinking, you know, investors are somehow on this like pedestal, and you know they. They know everything and, and, you know, you, you get really discouraged by someone saying no. Um, uh, but I think going through it and, and, and learning like, oh, that's, that's just one person's perspective. And, and there's a whole bunch of perspectives out there. There's a whole bunch of different types of investors. And, you know, you just got to keep going and talking to it. Eventually you'll find the right people who, who you and your idea resonate with. Uh, but, but, you know, really not to get discouraged by when someone when someone says no for the first time, I think, I think it's an, uh, an important lesson to learn. In, uh, in both times that you raised, did you already have a certain amount of traction or what stage were you at when you decided to, uh, look for some capital? Um, I mean, this time around we had kind of, a. uh, we kind of a, had an idea on the back of a napkin, so to speak, or, or the back of a PowerPoint deck, um, and, uh, and a small prototype that I coded up, um, uh, in Python to show folks. Um, and I think given my background and, and Tongi's background, you know, investors were, were more willing to, to take a chance on, uh, something that was less polished, um, uh, you know, I think you need kind of three things to, to raise money. You need to be going after a big market. You need to have a good team. Uh, and you need to have like uh, some traction or, or, or initial product. Um, and if you, you know, if you don't have, if you don't have one of those, you know, you have to be really strong in the other areas to kind of make up for it. Um, uh, so, you know, we were lucky to have a really good team of, of experienced folks who, who had some credibility in the industry this time around. Um, uh, the first time, first time around too, I guess we had that, I, you know, my, my partners there, um, they, they had a lot of great connections and, and experience. I was, I was far more junior than they were, um, uh, at Zesty. So I guess I guess I got lucky in in in, in both cases and, and being able to rely on some credibility uh, that was built beforehand. Um, but I think for for first time entrepreneurs it it can be it can be a lot harder. Um, and I I think you notice this with like you know say like Mark Zuckerberg or or, or Bill Gates like you know they hadn't done this before and so you actually you know, what, what got them through the door was actually having a product that they had already built. Um, uh, and, uh, I think, I think for folks who don't have some experience or some credibility within the industry, that's, that's probably the route you have to go. Um, but, but, you know, 
in, in, in both cases with, with uh, Zesty and, and Paxton, you know, I was lucky to partner with, with folks who, who, who brought some credibility to the, the process and, and uh, leverage that to, to raise money. So it sounds like three things there. Team, very important. Product, also very important. And market size, what you're going after. And if your product isn't there, your team better be amazing. But the market's already, always got to be something that's uh, attractive for investors. Yeah. Um, you know, not every business is, uh, is venture capital uh, fundable. Um, you know, the, the, the model, um, the model is that you need a couple home runs to pay for uh, all the losses. So, so one Facebook like outcome pays for the, the 90, 99 other investments that, that didn't necessarily work out. So each one of those investments has to be going for something big. So that's, that's what venture capital is sort of looking for. And that's why. That's why it's not appropriate for, for every business. You really need that potential for, for a big outcome uh, in order for, for it to be worth it for this type of capital to, to fund you. Um, I mean, there's, there's other sources of capital for other, uh, other types of businesses, but, but if, if you're really looking to appeal to VCs, you, you gotta have that. Now that you're uh, where you are, are you investing in projects? Is it, do you have deals coming at you? Uh, how does that work now that, uh, you've kind of gone through this a couple of times? Yeah. Um, we have a, a really strong engineering team that, that I think has built a really incredible product, um, that is being used by thousands of attorneys, um, in their day-to-day -day work, uh, to help them be more efficient, to, to draft better and, and to cut down on, on time spent, uh, in legal research. Um, and so we're continuing to make improvements on the product every day, uh, add new features, improve functionality. Um, and then, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of splitting my time between product development and, and our go to market. So making sure we're, we're talking to existing clients about what they would like to see and how we could make Paxton even more valuable for them. Uh, and then talking to, to, to new clients, um, you know, I think, I think for a lot of, uh, first time entrepreneurs, uh, there's this feeling that, you know, you, you build a great product and, and people will just somehow find you. Um, and, and, you know, that's, that's never the case. You, you gotta be, you gotta be out there pounding the virtual pavement, you know, having conversations like this to get your, get your name out there and, and, uh, make sure people know that, that you have a product that can deliver value to them. Because there's just so much, so much noise today and, and people are busy, you know, they're not going to, not just going to go proactively find you. That, uh, that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, people only have so much time, so you really have to do a good job in uh, getting in front of them. So uh, hopefully this, uh, gets in front of a few people that, uh, sign up for Paxton and, uh, have a, a great opportunity there. Uh, it, you sound very passionate in uh in the work that you're doing and you probably wear a number of hats uh what's the favorite part of your job um gosh i, I uh yeah I, I i really love what i do and I'm, I'm very lucky to be be able to do it um you know working with working with cool tech and, and working with great people and great clients i mean we have a wonderful team of, of really smart people, but, but they're also very, uh, genuine, nice people to work with that, that you, it's, it's fun tackling hard problems with them. And that sort of team and camaraderie, I think is, is really fun. Um, and then hearing the stories about, you know, how Paxton has, has impacted someone's work and, and given them time back in their day or, or made their life a little bit easier. Um, is, is really rewarding to hear about. Um, and we have, we have a lot of the clients and lawyers that, that send us stories like that. And, and, you know, it's, it's, uh, there, there are a lot of hard parts of being an entrepreneur and trying to get something off the ground. So, but being with people who, who are in this together and, and, uh, uh, hearing from, from quote folks that you, you actually made a difference for, um, this is really re rewarding for me. 
testimonials definitely make you feel good and make it all worthwhile. So uh, it's great that those put a smile on your face. Uh, tell me, Mike, what's your biggest challenge as a leader? Um, you know, I, I, I don't necessarily like terms that, that compare things to war. Because, you know, we're not we're not in a war, but but uh, the, the the fog of war, I guess, is the best term I've I've, I've found for this particular problem. And um, you know, when you leave when you leave like big corporate life or or other pursuits and go into entrepreneurship, and there's just a ton of things you can do and a ton of directions you can head in. And only very scant pieces of information to base your direction on. Um, and not only you have to base your own direction on those, you have to convince your team or your clients uh, to, to, to also follow you in that direction. Um, and I think that can be pretty challenging, both, you know, to know which way to head, um, but you, you, might, you might be wrong. Uh, and and uh, convincing other people to to come along with you for the for the journey. Um, if you're doing your job right, and you know you end up finding the right direction, it, it hopefully the fog starts to clear. And, and you know I think we're at that that stage. But it's kind of that uh, um, you know it's like the 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 blank canvas can can turn into anything. Um, and uh, Figuring out where to start and and what what it should turn into, um, you know, it's part of the fun, but it's it's also uh, can be a bit disorienting too, um, because there's there's just so many options and, and so little time to to actually make a decision and, and pick a direction. Yeah, we all have the same amount of time, right? That those twenty four hours. How do you prioritize what's most important? Um. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of, of trying to iterate quickly, um, tackle things that um, you can, you know, either fail fast or, or um, get some, some new information by doing a quick test. Um, so we, we kind of have this prioritization framework that, that I think works quite well for us. Um, you know, we evaluate things uh, based on you know, their potential impact. So, you know, imagine, imagine this thing goes amazingly well, like, what does that, what does that mean? You know, what, what are the returns on that? Um, how easy is it? Uh, so, you know, high impact, really easy things, uh, uh, you know, like you should probably do those. Um, and then your probability of success. Uh, so hopefully, you know, you can start with the things that are easy, high impact, and, and most likely to succeed. Um, but, you know, you, you often don't have many of those. So uh, I think trying to talk about things on, on this basis and, and make trade-offs amongst the three are, are a really helpful way of, of thinking about priorities and, and what, what should be done. Um, you know, you, you might be tackling something really hard with a low probability of success, but uh, if at the end goal end state there's a massive return like that, that could be worth it. But if something's really hard and and uh, not likely to succeed, and and even if you do succeed, you know it, the the returns are pretty small. That's probably not something you want to do. Good advice, Dally Mike. I'm sure you've uh, read a lot of books as an entrepreneur. One of my favorite questions: What are some of your favorites? Uh, good question. Um, yeah, you know, recently I've been more on the, the 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 technical side of things. Um, That's okay. <laughs> I really I really like an elegant puzzle by Will Larson, um, which is a say that. Uh, can you say the title again? An elegant puzzle. Okay. Um, so Will Larson is a CTO from. A lot of different companies. I think he's currently CTO of, of Carta, um, held leadership positions at, at Uber and Calm. And he wrote probably the, I think the best 
practical guide to, to engineering management, especially as you scale an organization called uh, an, an elegant puzzle. So like if folks are looking for something super practical, like there's, there's a lot of stuff in there about team size and, and structuring an organization and, and conducting performance reviews. And, and I, I think it's just wonderful. It's, it's probably the, the book I recommend the most. That sounds perfect. I'm going to check it out. Uh, what else you got that uh, you like to either revisit or that's been uh, something you found fascinating? Um, well, yeah, I, I don't want this to sound the wrong way, but there's a book called the uh, the, the Dictator's Handbook by uh, by uh, Bruce Buena de Mesquita. Um, he is a political scientist, um, and this is kind of the the pop pop. Um, what are called veto players or, or kind of how organizations uh, function and make decisions. And, and you know, I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a political science book, but um, it, it can really apply to, to large organizations or groups of people generally. Um, and just understanding kind of the different incentives of, of leaders involved in an organization, um, I think he does a really really great job at it. And, and I think he picked the title to be a little edgy or, or get attention, but, um, in terms of really understanding a big, how a big organization makes decisions, I think it's a, it's a great guide. That's cool. So we got, uh, we got two, you got one more for us. One more. Um, no pressure. Yeah. I mean, I'm reading Dune right now. I, I Dune. I'm pretty excited for Dune. What did you think of the last movie? I, I thought it was great. A little slow for me. Yeah. It was a long one. But uh, you had read the book before. So that's yeah. that's a different story. I did not read the book before. So it was all new and um, definitely incredible visuals, though. Wow. They yeah. uh, did a great job. Yeah. Uh, Denis Villeneuve is an incredible director and, and you know, yeah, I think definitely more on the on the cinematography and visual side of things. Um, but the the book is just a great story. You know, kind of like uh, Space Game of Thrones. So, um, but less, yeah. uh, you know, less of a practical book, but uh, uh, I, I I really enjoyed it. Nice. Um, on the topic of uh, fundraising, were there any books that? Uh, were something that you'd recommend or things that uh, you came across when you were at that phase of your journey? Um, there was one, uh, I'm blanking on the name. Um, it just came out, there was a really interesting history of venture capital. Um, uh, maybe I can pull it up qu quickly here. Yeah, go for it. It's called the Power Law by Sebastian Malaby. Um, and okay, now we're talking. It, it's probably you know I I had no idea how like like venture capital started or or you know the history of it, and he documents it really well. Um, you know, from it <laughs> it started as uh, something called adventure capital. And, and that's kind of where the name, name comes from. Um, but, you know, if you, if you wanted to go out and, and start something uh, like a tech company that needed to scale quickly, uh, you know, there was a time where like the only sorts of capital available were like the public markets or like a bank loan or, or you know, an investment from some rich guy. And he really talks about kind of how this all came together and, and kind of how it formed into the giant industry it is today. Um, so I think that was helpful in understanding how things worked. Um, and then one of our, one of our investors, uh, Unusual Ventures, they have something on their website called uh, the Field Guide. Um, and it's, 
it's I think it's more tailored to starting a, a B2B uh, SaaS company, but they have some really great tips on, on how to do fundraising and um, how to do your initial product development and how to do your initial go to market. It's, it's another one of those really probably what, what the best kind of tactical or practical resource I've, I've found on, on a lot of those topics. Um, so, so that's, that's another one I recommend to a lot of folks. Well, you're, you're dropping some great uh, knowledge bombs here out of, uh, out of respect for your time, we're, we're almost uh, at the hour. I just wanted to say thank you so much for this. This has been a really a real pleasure. For those that are interested in learning more about Paxton AI, uh, give us a website. Where can they find more about the platform and uh, if they want to get in touch with you as well? Yeah, absolutely. I uh, really enjoyed it as well too, uh, Mark. Um, we can be found at, at paxton.ai, so P-A-X-T-O-N.ai. Um, we're pretty active on LinkedIn, so if you just search for Paxton AI um, or Michael Ulan on LinkedIn, that's a that's a great way to get in touch with us. Uh, with me. And uh, we can also be reached at hello at Paxton. May have just froze there for a second with a little delay, but I know we're we're recording locally, so this will be all nice and high quality. Well, Mike, I want to thank you again for making some time. This has been the AI Training Podcast. If you like this episode and you want more episodes like this one, you can check out openaitraining.com where you'll get a ton of great resources and uh, more information. So uh, that's the show. Thank you, Mike. I'm going to just hit uh, stop here and then we'll let these upload.